Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight we conclude our five part study of the Upali Paripricha Sutra, the questions of Upali. Um, I didn't get quite as far as I wanted to last week. And all that means is that we're going to kind of just move a little quickly through a few things. And one of the things about this sutra that we've been reading that's kind of very beautiful is that there is this wonderful poem at the end of the sutra that in many ways the whole sutra is leading up to this poem. And tonight I would really like to read the poem in its entirety. It's sort of, you know, I think uh, uh, worth worth doing in that way. So I'm going to bring us up to speed in terms of where we're at in the sutra. There's one very important idea that we need to discuss to sort of have firmly in mind. Um, and then we're, we're going to discuss a few things quickly. And then I want to read the poem. And I definitely also want to leave a little bit of room at the end because the poem may bring things to mind. So I wanna have a chance to address any ideas or comments that anybody has. So, you know, again, really quickly, this sutra is an interesting Mahayana Buddhist sutra that's dealing with the idea of Vinaya or Vinaya, the idea of the discipline. And what we've been exploring in this sutra is that from a Mahayana point of view, there is a different moral discipline or like a different Vinaya for monks and nuns versus bodhisattvas. And, you know, the general, the basic idea is that the life of a monastic, whether they are a monk or a nun, it's actually about following these rules and following them closely and you know following them to the letter in a way whereas because the bodhisattva has taken it upon themselves to expediently liberate all beings it may be that a bodhisattva doesn't observe certain rules to you know to the umpteenth degree but because they have a higher calling of this compassion towards all beings so the bodhisattva is in this kind of what we would call kind of more relative ethics in that way where the situation dictates the ethic whereas in the monastic path the ethic is very well determined and you just don't you don't go against that ethic. So this has sort of been the nature of the sutra, which is like, what is moral discipline? What is the Vinaya like for bodhisattvas versus monastics? But then things got even more interesting last week when the bodhisattva Manjushri steps up. And last week, Manjushri, who's, you know, represents this kind of profound wisdom of pranya paramita manjushri has this question of since all dharmas are already the vinaya why are there why bother with all the regulations why are regulations even necessary and this sort of raised an issue for who was it for Upali. So Upali is basically saying, whoa, Manjushri is not saying anything about morality. He's basically saying, you know, there's no reason to follow the regulations in that way, since all dharmas are, are the Vinaya already. And that's where the, the Buddha sort of asks Manjushri to elaborate further. And that's when Manjushri started getting into all of these different aspects of all dharmas and sort of rattling off these different approaches to understanding the vinaya from the 
from the position of the ultimate truth. And so for tonight, in order to get us right back up to speed, and especially so that we can get to this poem that I keep talking about, I want to pick up, it's basically where we left, left off last week. And this is what Manjushri has been telling us about the Vinaya. So tonight, we want to start with this idea. <clears throat> Manjushri tells us that all dharmas abide in emptiness when the mind is free of all characteristics. This is called the Vinaya of intrinsic transcendence. So there's a lot of ideas just in that sentence. So we're going to use that as our starting point tonight. So let's begin to break this down. So I want to remind you again, Manjushri is coming from this position of the ultimate truth, not conventional relative truth, but the ultimate truth. And here it's being articulated as the ultimate truth of emptiness. And so let's, again, let's break this down really quickly. All dharmas abide in emptiness when the mind is free of all characteristics. So let's begin with the idea of what would it be, what does it mean for the mind to be free of all characteristics? Let's start with that idea. So the first thing that we want to remember, and if you have the big yellow book in your reading, you've already noticed that I've retranslated the word signs when the mind is free of all signs. So the word sign, S-I-G-N, is a very old kind of like 70s, 80s way of translating this term lakshana. And, you know, if you dig around deep enough, you can come to an understanding of lakshana by the word sign. But in my world, at least for me, in my mind, in my vocabulary, signs, the word sign is completely useless in terms of representing laksha. I don't know what to do it like a stop sign, you know, or, you know, like a, it just it loses its oomph. So of course, I like to translate this term, this word lakshana as characteristic. It could also be translated as quality. Of course, the word quality, it has, it's the correct word philosophically speaking, but in English, when we hear the word quality, we can start to, uh, we can consider, we can think that we're talking about value and we're not talking about value. So I don't like to use the word quality, but the idea of a characteristic. So what would it mean for the mind to be free of all characteristics? Well, the basic idea, and, you know, most of you, it looks like most of you are, you know, very regular Dharma door attendees. So I know that you already know <clears throat> about the tricky nature of characteristics. But in case there's anybody watching who isn't totally familiar with it, what we're talking about is, it's actually in, in like Western philosophy, it's what we would be known as epistemology. So if you've ever heard the term epistemology, epistemology is the idea of how do we know what we know? <laughs> That's the study of epistemology is the question of how do we know anything, right? It's an interesting philosophical discipline. And so what we mean is, and, you know, I have all of my different props here and I've been debating what's it going to be tonight? Is it going to be the cups? Is it going to be the clock? What's it going to be? And I, I will probably introduce a few different ones, but I'm going to stick with this, this one for a while. I've used it already a few times, so I kind of just want to stick with it. But the question is, 
How do you know what that is? And the idea is, is that you quote, know, you know what this is based on its characteristics. So we're talking about the color is an indicator to your mind of what this is. The shape is an indicator of your mind of what this is. The size of it is an indicator in your mind of what it is. And so lakshana or characteristics are the characteristics of something by, by which we know what it is. And so that's the idea. And of course, Why don't you, why don't you think this is a roll of toilet paper? Because <laughs> it doesn't have the qualities or the characteristics of a roll of toilet paper. It's the wrong color. It's the wrong shape, right? Or it's kind of almost the right shape until we do that, right? And so my point is, is that we differentiate object A from object B based on its characteristics and then we know what to call this, or we know what it is because of its characteristics. But here's the thing that we always talk about in Dharma doors. What we think is that the color of something is inherent to the thing. We think that the size of something is inherent. We think the shape of something is inherent. And let me add this to the mix. Another characteristic is use value. Like what your mind thinks it could do with that. That's a characteristic too. So as, as, the, as the kids say, this is giving sanitation, right? It's, it's giving bathroom cleanliness, right? Like that's the vibe it's giving off, right? So again, it could be color, shape, size, and then use or function. And of course, there's many, 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 many more characteristics. I'm just dealing with the basic ones, right? Now, the first one that I always like to start with is color because it is the most direct to the point. We think the color is here and that the, like, let's say the white color is inherent to this, but we know that that's not true. We know that depending upon the form of the eyes, meaning the particular sets of rods and cones in your eyeball, it's dependent upon them that ultimately give rise to the color in the mind. And what we know from colorblindness is that somebody that has a different set of rods and cones, meaning a different formed eyes, they may see a different color. And what that reveals to us is that color is not inherent in objects. Now, of course, then what the Buddha said, asks is, oh, so then the color is in your mind. Like that's where the color is. And then the retort is, why don't you see, I got to cover up my shirt, but why don't you see white white here. If the white is in your eyes, then why don't you see it here? Why do you need this to bring about the white color in your mind? And that's when the Buddha reveals, yeah, the whiteness is not in your mind either. It is dependently originated between the two, neither in the eyes or in the object, but dependently originated in that sense. The most important part about this, though, is that we think that the quality or the characteristic of color is in the thing. 
when that's actually not true and we know it's not true. Where this gets a little trickier is when we start talking about things like shape. There's a way in which we can be like, okay, I'm with you on the color thing, but the shape of something? No, 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 no. The shape is actually inherent in the object. The shape is not up for debate, is, is the idea. But what we need to recognize is that, and I don't have, well, what I want to point out is that thinking that this is circular is relative to something like this that you might think is square. Why, do you, why would you think that this is square? Well, relative to something like this. So this is where it starts to get more subtle. And again, I wish I had a white box in that way. But my point is, is that even though we think that shape is something that's here, if you look deeper, you realize it's another phenomena, another characteristic or quality that's actually arising in the mind of the beholder, so to speak, but is being imputed or superimposed onto the object. And as I have shown you many, many times with my big cup and my little cups, the size of this even though you might think this has an absolute size, the, re the reality is, is that the size of this is always going to be relative to other objects. And unto itself, it doesn't have a size. Again, for most of you, this should all be review in that way. But now what we're doing is, oh, and then the idea of the use of this Come on, I already told you, this isn't a roll of toilet paper, it's my scarf. This is my delicate, fancy scarf. And as a scarf, it has a completely different use value. So when you are seeing a roll of toilet paper, you are projecting out onto some, well, we'll get to that in a moment, of like, well, what's being projected out onto? But the idea is, is that the whiteness, the roundness, the size, the use, we think all of those things are inherent properties of objects. And what the ultimate truth of Buddhism is all about is that that's actually not what's happening. They are actually not inherent in the object. Now, if everybody's with me on characteristics, everybody with me on characteristics? When Manjushri says this thing that when the mind is free of all characteristics, what they mean is free of imputing those characteristics. Not being deluded into thinking that the color, shape, size is out there. If the mind is not confused about that, if the mind doesn't think the properties or the qualities are out there, if the mind understands that they are dependently originated, then the mind is free of all characteristics. So now let's go back to the whole sentence, because the whole sentence is, is that all phenomena, all dharmas, abide in emptiness when the mind is free of characteristics. So how do we get there? So this is where we get to the super interesting relationship between these lakshana, these characteristics, and this idea of emptiness this elusive Buddhist concept of emptiness. So what I want you to be thinking about now is this. If you're with me and you understand that how the 
qualities or the characteristics of this are not actually here. If you're with me on that, now that raises the very interesting question. What am I referring to? And I know at this point you might want to say the roll of toilet paper, but we've established though that the, the toilet paperness, if you will, we've established that the toilet paperness is not here. That's something that where somebody who would use it that way is imputing it. And we know that again, the color, the shape, the size, and all of that aren't here. So what are we left with? In particular, what I'm getting at is, is that if we understand that this quote unquote is not inherently a roll of toilet paper, what is it? It's not inherently a scarf either. That's just the way I would use it. So what is it? And what we realize is that if you look really carefully, there's one of these in there. And so this isn't actually a singular entity. This is not actually one thing. That's another lakshana. The lakshana of being one thing. right? These <laughs> have the characteristic of being two things. You're not confused. You, your mind is not melding these into a CD record. Your mind clearly holds these as two separate entities. Yet, the little cardboard piece in there and then all of this your mind just goes, nope, one thing, just one. And then we start doing this. And we're like, really? This is just one thing? And again, what we're realizing is that singularity is another characteristic. And we've learned that characteristics are not inherent in the thing. They are projections of the mind in that sense. So it is only the mind that is holding this as a singular object. And so if there's no singular object, no inherent scarf or toilet paper, no inherent whiteness, no inherent size, no inherent shape, again, what we're looking for is, what is it then? And the point is, is that we could keep thinking, we could keep searching, we could keep looking. And by the way, I always point this out, Western physics, like Western philosophy, is still searching. It's still searching for like what is underneath all the characteristics. 2000, 2,500 years ago, the Buddha realized, oh, there's nothing under there emptiness. And so that's the relationship between characteristics and emptiness. If we understand that objects are actually characteristic lists, because those characteristics are not inherent in them, if we take all the characteristics away, what are we talking about? The characteristics are what inform us <laughs> of what it is. And therefore, if you don't have the characteristics, you don't have a thing anymore to talk about. And that's the idea of emptiness. And so again, Manjushri says, all dharmas abide in emptiness when the mind is free of all characteristics. This is called the vinya of intrinsic transcendence.
questions, comments, or ideas about any of that? Yeah, Noe. Um, the, 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 this is the same thing we're talking about with Lakshanas. Lakshanas, yes? Okay, <laughs> thank you. What page are we on? 271. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you, yeah, Michael. Yeah. yeah, I'm right there with you. It's just the idea of Lakshanas or characteristics or signs. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. One last comment on that this is called the Vinaya or the Vinaya of intrinsic transcendence. So what I want you to kind of feel or kind of appreciate about that, about that title of the idea of intrinsic transcendence. So in the Hinayana, in the early form of Buddhism, there was the world of phenomena, the, the world of objects and things, all right? And in the original form of Buddhism, all of this, the world of objects and things, it was a big, like, it just a big temptation fest to be tempted by things and to be stimulated by things and all of that. And so it was advisable to transcend the phenomenal world by doing meditation. And so by getting into a meditative state and typically closing your eyes, closing the sense doors, moving into a deep internal contemplative meditative state, where all of the phenomenal objects of the world just disappeared. And this is, you know, pratyahara, the withdrawing inward. And then you have transcended the world of the phenomenal. You've transcended all the desires of this world and you're in this meditative state. That's how early Buddhism would have spoken of transcendence of moving beyond the things of the world. What Manjushri has just introduced us to is this idea of intrinsic transcendence, which is that in order to transcend the role of toilet paper, you don't need to move into a deep meditative state of mind. You just need to recognize that there is no role of toilet paper, that that is an imputed, projected idea. Ultimately, just a word. And if you can really kind of grok that, then that is, you are already transcendent. It is already the case. You just didn't know that you were so transcendent in that way. Okay, so, and we're feeling good about, okay. So now I can quickly go through the rest of these because Manjushri also tells us that all dharmas, all phenomena, that dharmas have no past, no present, and no future, for they are inapprehensible. You, you can't get them. You will not find them. This is called the vinaya of the equality of the three phases of time, the equality of past, present, and future. Now, this is deep, and we could, we could spend all night just on this one. So if you were with me about the emptiness of the roll of toilet paper, which is that there isn't a roll of toilet paper, and that's just an imputed, superimposed concept word idea, that ultimately, by the way, let's remember, is not being imputed onto anything. It is just the mental act of imputing <laughs> in that way. Now, if we understand that, and therefore we would understand the true nature of said roll of toilet paper, did this roll of toilet, did the roll of toilet paper exist yesterday? We just talked about how it doesn't exist now, <laughs> that it's just a superimposed idea. So 
the idea is is that it didn't exist it doesn't exist now therefore it didn't exist before and it will not exist tomorrow it will always only be a fictitious superimposed imputed idea and therefore it doesn't exist in time and therefore it's not in the past present or future now what Manjushri is doing here, though, is he's, he wants you to remember that what we're talking about is true of all dharmas. All of them aren't in the past, present, and future. So what is the past, present, or future then? What, what could possibly be in the past? what could possibly be here now and then what could possibly be there in the future if all dharmas are empty in the way that we've just established now the other way of course that you can get into what he's talking about is to appreciate that the past doesn't exist and i mean that like it you cannot touch the past you cannot see the past it is it does not exist the future doesn't exist either. You can't touch it. You can't see it. If the past and the future don't exist, then we're only left with this elusive razor, razor sharp sliver of time called the present. And as we know, the present doesn't last very long at all. Meaning every present moment has already gone away. And so what is the past? What is the present? What is the future? More superimposed, imputed ideas. Are we okay with that? <laughs> All right. And oh, by the way, too, let's, yeah, let's move through this because if we get all these ideas in our head nice, the poem will actually explain a lot. So. But Manjushri's got a few more for us. The next one he says is, is that no dharma, no dharma can be established when the mind is free from discrimination. Now, yeah, I mean, we, we can just deal with this as it is translated. When they say established, of course, they mean like instantiated, like made to be real, made to exist in that way. And so this idea that no dharma can ultimately be established when the mind is free from discrimination. And I want to remind you that when the Buddhists talk about discrimination, Yes, of course, they're talking about things like racial discrimination and sexual discrimination. Of course, they're talking about that. But they're actually talking about just differentiating this from that at all. And so we, you know, we could go back to these. And the idea is, is that you may be perceiving two objects, and that's due to differentiation. That's due to discriminating this from this. Now, what happens if the mind is free from discrimination? <laughs> well, you can maybe see how no specific dharma could be established if the mind is free from discrimination. Now, now what might be tempting, by the way, it might be tempting then to, to think, oh, you're right, Buddha, about discriminating this from that. And therefore, you might be tempted to think in terms of oneness, to think in terms of like a grand unity. But that too is discriminatory in its own way. And so when the Buddhists are talking about non-discrimination, they, they mean it absolutely. And that's 
different, and I'm kind of always drawing attention to this, that that's different than the idea of oneness, unity, or all of those ideas. The idea of non-discrimination is actually very deep. But again, if you understand what it would mean to not discriminate me from you, this from that, here from there, all of that, then you can understand this idea of no dharma being established. You won't find any specific individuated dharma when the mind is free from discrimination. And this is called the vinaya of the permanent resolution of doubt. <laughs> Upali. This is the, this is Manjushri talking, by the way. Upali. This is the ultimate vinaya of the Dharma Dattu, by which Buddhas, world honored ones, have attained Buddhahood. A good person who does not observe this well is far from keeping the pure precepts of the Tathagata. Thereupon, Upali said to the Buddha, World honored one, the doctrines Manjushri expounds are inconceivable. And the world honored one told Upali, Manjushri expounds the Dharma on the basis of the inconceivable, the unimpeded liberation. For this reason, whatever doctrine he preaches enables one to be free from mental forms, which is liberation of mind. He causes the arrogant to give up their arrogance. But then Upali asks, asks the Buddha, what constitutes the arrogance of a monk, of a shravaka? In this translation, it says, or a bodhisattva, but that's kind of, I don't know, I wouldn't exactly include that. Let's just focus on the, this idea of Upali asking the Buddha, what constitutes arrogance for a monk or a nun in that way, but for a monastic? Everybody okay with proceeding? Cool. So the Buddha tells Upali, if a monk thinks he has eradicated desire, he's arrogant. <laughs> if he thinks he's eradicated the other afflictions, hatred and ignorance, he's arrogant. If he thinks that desire is different from the Dharma of Buddhas, he's arrogant. If he thinks the hatred, that hatred is different from the Dharma of Buddhas, he's arrogant. If he thinks that ignorance is different from the Dharma of Buddhas, he's arrogant. If he claims to have gained something, he's arrogant. If he claims to have realized something, he's arrogant. If he claims to have obtained liberation, he's arrogant. If he claims to perceive emptiness, characteristiclessness, and wishlessness, he's also arrogant. If he claims to perceive non-arising and non-action, he's arrogant. If he claims to perceive the existence of dharmas, he's arrogant. If he claims to perceive the impermanence of dharmas, he's arrogant. If he says, what's the use of practice since all dharmas are empty? He is also arrogant. Upali, these constitute the arrogance of a shravaka, of a monk. Yeah? All of those good? Cool. Now, what constitutes the arrogance of a bodhisattva? If a bodhisattva thinks they should resolve to seek all-knowing wisdom, they're arrogant. If they think they should practice the six paramitas, they're arrogant. 
if they say only the paramita of pranya wisdom can be depended upon to achieve liberation, there's no other way out of the three realms, they're arrogant. If they say one dharma is very profound and another is not, this is arrogant. If they say one dharma is pure, but another dharma is impure. Oops, sorry, I have all so many notes. I lost my place. Oh yeah, so if, he, if, if they say that one dharma is pure and another is not, then that is arrogant. If they say, this is the dharma of Buddhas, this other dharma, that's the dharma of Pratekya Buddhas. This is the dharma for Shravakas. Then they are arrogant. If they say, this should be done and that should not be done, they are arrogant. If they say, this dharma is profound and that one is not, they are arrogant. If they say this is the right path and that's the wrong path, they are arrogant. If they ask, can I attain supreme enlightenment quickly or not? <laughs> they are arrogant. <clears throat> if they say all dharmas are inconceivable and only I can understand them, they are arrogant. If they think of the inconceivable supreme enlightenment, and they become greatly attached to it, then they are arrogant. <clears throat> These constitute the arrogance of a bodhisattva. Questions about those? Those were a little trickier because they're a little seemingly, you know, kind of either contradictory or, but I think maybe we can all make sense of them, yeah? Cool. So that brings us to the poem, or just about. <clears throat> so this is perfect timing, because this is indeed, oh yeah, please know. Um, just, just a quick question. I, I'm just trying, that was a lot of, those were a lot of words. <laughs> yes. And, I, and I'm just, I'm just sort of big picture trying to contrast the list for Protecti Buddhas versus uh, Bodhisattvas, mm -hmm. and the they both seemed to deal in, to, to some extent with duality. But, mm -hmm. but what could you do? You have a sort of a take on what the main difference is, or how they're yep. the same and how they're different. The main difference that you might notice is that regarding the Shravaka, the monk. It's all these series of what would be called samapati attainments. Mm -hmm. So this idea that the, the monk is claiming, I've eradicated anger. I've achieved this, this state of, I've made all these achievements. And that, that constitutes arrogance thinking that you have arrived at the end, right? Like that's the idea. Whereas you'll notice that all the bodhisattva things are these ideas of sort of like opinions about the dharma differentiating considering one like it's basically like the language of thinking one dharma is profound and another dharma is not that's like thinking that the dharma of say emptiness is profound but a roll of toilet paper is like whatever but we've just shown that the role of toilet paper is emptiness. This is profound. So the bodhisattva, it would be arrogant to say that that's profound, but that's not. Or especially the idea of that's pure, that's not. So we notice that in the bodhisattva, it's all a way of thinking. And it and it's like discrimination, a lot of it, or yes. all of it, right? Versus pretty, pretty much. The Protecti Buddha is more that what we normally think of as arrogance, like claiming you, you're so, you're so whatever. Yep. There's also in the first few, um, if a bodhisattva thinks that they should resolve to seek all knowledge, 
So there's also even an indication that the notion of a moral imperative is wrong. It's like a, a bad way of thinking about it. If you think you should, that's like sort of this kind of guilt complex versus the idea of thinking it's wise. <laughs> it's wise to vow to achieve all knowledge. So yeah, thank you. Okay, so I feel like we did good as far as I feel like we did a good emptiness, like we're, we're there, I feel like. And that's important because the Buddha's poem is pretty deep. And yeah, let's get into it so we can have plenty of time at the end. So Upali asks the Buddha then, world honored one, how can a monk be free from arrogance? And the Buddha answered Upali saying, if they are not attached to any dharma, no matter how inconceivable it is, they are completely free from ignorance. Yeah. Then, to explain the teaching further, the world honored one spoke these verses. All play words arise from the mind. No discrimination should be made between what is dharma and what is not. One who sees the dharma as inconceivable will always dwell happily in the world. Being deluded, ordinary people are turned by their own minds. For kalpas, they circle and circle in the various realms of samsara. It is truly inconceivable to know that the nature of all dharmas is no nature. If a monk stays mindful of the Buddhas, his thought is not proper, and his mindfulness is not right mindfulness. Vainly making distinctions about Buddhas, he sees no truth whatsoever. One who thinks about the teaching of emptiness is a fool, lingering on the wrong path. Explanations of emptiness are mere words. Both words and emptiness are inapprehensible. One who contemplates the teaching of quiescence should know the mind is empty and unborn. The mind's reflections and observations are all futile and meaningless. To have no thought and make no distinctions, that is to see all dharmas. For all dharmas are apart from conceptual thought. And all thoughts and all ideas are empty. One who enjoys contemplation on emptiness should tr transcend even the state without thought. Dharmas, like grass and trees, have no awareness. Apart from the mind, they are all inapprehensible. Sentient beings are devoid of self-entity. So are all dharmas. The eye can see while there's sunlight, but it sees not when night falls. If the eye could see all by itself, why should it rely on, the condition, on conditions to act? It is entirely due to various lights that the eye can see all colors. Since sight depends upon conditions, it is obvious that by itself, the eye cannot see. A pleasant sound vanishes as soon as it's heard. One knows not where it goes. It is due to discrimination that the concept of sound arises. All dharmas are but the sounds of words, and the words are merely arbitrary fabrications. 
not knowing that these sounds are neither dharmas nor not dharmas, ordinary people vainly cling to them. I praise giving for the sake of the world, but giving is intrinsically empty. I teach, though there is nothing to teach. Inconceivable indeed is the Buddha Dharma. I often praise the observance of pure precepts, but no being ever breaks any precepts. Precept breaking is empty by nature, and so is precept keeping. I say it is superb to be patiently tolerant, but patient tolerance is apart from views and by nature does not arise. There is really nothing to cause anger. To realize this is called supreme kashanti patience. I say it is unexcelled to work vigorously day and night and to remain alert even in sleep. Yet, even if one has practiced vigorously, diligently for kalpas, their efforts never increase or decrease anything. I teach dhyana meditation, liberation and samadhis to show the world the door to the truth. Yet the Dharma nature is never stirred from the beginning and meditation of all kinds is fabricated merely to comply with sentient beings. That which observes and comprehends is called pranya wisdom. One who understands all dharmas is called wise. Yet dharmas by nature do not exist, and there is no one who observes or comprehends. I often praise austere practices and extol those who delight in such ways to tranquility. But only those who know that all dharmas are inapprehensible may really be called pure, contented ones. I describe the sufferings of the hell realms so that countless peoples may abhor them, or so that countless people may abhor falling into the terrible realms after death. But in reality, there are no such miserable places. No one can produce, no one can produce therein knives or cudgels or similar means of torture. It is discrimination that causes one to see them and to suffer the immeasurable tortures put to them. Gardens covered with various lovely flowers and palaces sparkling with numerous jewels. These things of heaven are created by no one. They all arise from discrimination, from delusive minds. The world though, the world is deceived by fictitious dharmas, which confuse one who is attached to them. However one discriminates among mirages, whether accepting or rejecting them, they are empty just the same. I say it is supreme to benefit the worlds by resolving to pursue enlightenment. But in truth, enlightenment is also inapprehensible, and there is no one who resolves to attain it. The mind by nature is ever pure and bright, unsullied by falsehood or passion. It is true. Ordinary people discriminate and engender attachment, yet from the very beginning, their defilements are empty. All dharmas are always quiescent in their self-nature. How can there be greed, anger, and delusion? One who sees nowhere to generate desire or renounce passion is said to have attained nirvana. Because one's mind is never truly defiled, one is able to achieve great enlightenment. Striving for various dharma practices for countless kalpas, I have delivered myriad sentient beings. Yet, 
Sentient beings themselves are inapprehensible. In reality, no beings are ever delivered. If a great magician produces a magic crowd of a billion beings and then destroys them again, no harm or good is ever done to these magical creatures. All beings are illusory, like magic. No borders or limits can be found. One who knows this absence of limits will never tire of living in the world. To one who knows the reality of things, constant involvement in samsara is nirvana. Amidst desires, one is not defiled. It is only to subdue sentient beings that they speak of the renunciation of desires. The most compassionate one, the Buddha, benefits all beings, but there is actually no person or life. To benefit sentient beings, yet not see them, this is difficult indeed, a great wonder. One may solace a crying child with an empty fist, saying it contains something for them, though the child might cry again when the hand opens and reveals nothing. Likewise, the inconceivable Buddhas subdue sentient beings skillfully. While they know Dharma nature is empty, they fabricate names for the sake of the world. With great kindness and compassion, they urge you, in my Dharma is supreme happiness. Leave your households and abandon your loved ones. You will then attain the superb fruit sought by the shramana. After one leaves the household life and practices the dharma in earnest, they attain nirvana. At last, through great practice, they then reflect at length upon the truth of all dharmas, and to their wonder, they discover that no fruit whatsoever is there to attain. No fruit and yet realization is achieved. Awestruck, they begin to marvel. How wonderful it is that the most compassionate lion of humans is so skillful in teaching the Dharma in compliance with reality. All Dharmas are like empty space, yet numerous names, words, and doctrines are used. The Buddha speaks of meditation and liberation. He speaks of roots, powers, and enlightenment. Yet, from the beginning, these roots and these powers do not arise, nor do meditation and enlightenment exist. Formless, shapeless, and ungraspable are these things. Sorry, formless, shapeless, and ungraspable. These things are only skillful means to eliminate living beings, to illuminate living beings. When I speak of the practice that leads to realization, I mean detachment from all forms. If one claims to have achieved anything, they are very far from realizing the shramana's fruit. No dharma has a self-entity. What is there to realize? The so-called realization is no attainment at all. To understand this is called attainment. Those who have obtained the fruit are said to be superior, but I say all beings are unborn from the very beginning. Since there is no sentient being in the first place, how can there be anyone achieving any fruit? If no seed is sown, how can any sprout come forth, even from a fertile field? <clears throat> Whence can realization come if there is no sentient being? All beings are by nature quiescent, and no one can find their origin. 
one who understands this doctrine will be in Parinirvana forever. Of the countless Buddhas in the past, none could deliver sentient beings. If sentient beings were truly existent, no one could have achieved nirvana. All dharmas are quiescent and empty. Never has a dharma arisen. One who can see all dharmas in this way has already transcended all three realms. This is the unhindered enlightenment of Buddhas. Yet ultimately, nothing exists therein. If one knows this doctrine, I say that they are free from desire. And when the World Honored One finished speaking in verse, 200 arrogant monks ended their defilements permanently and became liberated in mind and 60,000 bodhisattvas attained the realization of the non-arising of all dharmas. Then Upali asked the Buddha, what should this sutra be called? How should we uphold it? And the Buddha told Upali, this sutra should be called the definitive vinya, or the elimination of the mind and consciousness. You should accept and hold it by these names. And when the Buddha had taught this sutra, the Venerable Upali, the monks, Manjushri, the great Bodhisattvas, humans, gods, and asuras, and so forth, were exceedingly joyful over the Buddha's teaching. They accepted it with faith and began to practice it in veneration. Okay, so there were many juicy, juicy bits in the poem, so... Any stick out to anybody as interesting, confusing? Oh, Noe. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Wow. Boom. Yeah. War. Uh, Yay. Yeah, I'm 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 good. <laughs> I will be reading this poem and maybe I'll memorize it. I just thought it was just fantastic. Yeah, it it, it, it it so speaks to next week and yeah. I didn't <laughs> so even really speaks. quite realize how uh, such a beautiful segue it is to next week. Yes. Yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, next week is uh, the Pali Kashana. Uh, right view the question of right view and this so speaks to that because it reminds me of the of, of the of the uh the skanhas the five skanhas it's speaking to that also form perception you know consciousness all of this is it's a wonderful wonderful hmm. study thank you so much for your teaching oh no thank you <laughs> anyone else Comments, questions, ideas? Yeah, Maria. Hmm? I just um I just always like comments like um they if if one claims to have achieved anything, they are far from realizing the shramana's fruit. Just always, always keeping um keeping us in check around you know if you really if you feel like you know you're going for anything you're getting anything you're you've gotten it wrong mm -hmm. um and so that that part always sticks out to me but lots of good stuff in there thank yeah. you mm -hmm. yeah it's a it's a beautiful poem i really hadn't really quite realized how succinct it is in that way like really right to the point um let's see well let's then i would like to then draw your attention to two ideas that are in the poem so one of them 
it's a, it's particular lang it's particular Buddhist language that I would like you all to be familiar with. So let me find it. Sorry. Where did it go? So, well, let's put, let's kind of work with this way. It has to do with this particular um, idea. Um, and the, the particular stanza that I'm thinking of is on page 275. And it's towards the bottom. And the Buddha says that striving for various Dharma practices for countless kalpas, I have delivered myriad sentient beings. Yet sentient beings themselves are inapprehensible. In reality, no beings are ever delivered. So that particular kind of idea is, you know, very, very essential to the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. It's kind of essential to all of the Pranya Paramita Sutras. And it has to do with this idea where the Buddha basically says, if I like hit the streets and just started like, bing, like enlightening people, bing, 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 and like one after the other, I'm enlightening people. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing and being silly, of course, but the idea is the Buddha says, I could go for kulpas and kulpas and kulpas, enlightening all these people. And in the end, not a single sentient being achieves enlightenment. And at first, that I know, you know, especially when I first encountered these ideas from the Vajra Sutra, that idea was like, what are they talking about? Like, it's like, what is going on with that? But then if you really look at it and you really think about not Maha, this is not Mahayana Buddhism. This is like really thinking about the teachings, the Dharma, even of the Hinayana. And what it is, is, is that, you know, what does it mean? What would it mean for the Buddha to come along and bing in it to enlighten you, let's say, what would, what would that mean? Well, what it would mean is, is that the Buddha would come along and you would realize no self. You would realize, oh, there isn't a me that I think. And that would constitute enlightenment. And that's how the Buddha could say that he could liberate all these sentient beings. And in the end, no sentient being ever achieves liberation. But it makes perfect sense, does it not? based on what we are defining enlightenment as, which is the realization that there isn't a sentient being. Now, that idea that even though the Buddha can enlighten everybody, no sentient being would ever get enlightened, but that's based on this teaching of anatman. This is based on the teaching of no self. Along with that idea, and I, I was looking for the particular, oh, I did, I found it. On page 274, a related idea that you also hear in the Heart Sutra and the Vajra Sutra. And what it is, is I, I'm on page 274, and the Buddha says, this is the like third-ish stanza down. I say it is unexcelled to work vigorously day and night and to remain alert even in sleep. Yet, even if one has practiced vigor diligently for kalpas, their efforts do not increase or decrease anything. So in the Heart Sutra, you may recall, if you're one of those, you know, if you're familiar with the Heart Sutra, you will remember this idea that it says this thing about in terms of all dharmas, that they neither arise nor cease, are neither defiled nor pure, and neither increase nor decrease. 
That's the, the language that's used in the Heart Sutra, and it's used throughout Buddhism. And this is a reference to it. This idea that of your, your efforts bringing about an increase or a decrease to something. And what they're referring to, you might be familiar, if you are more familiar with the Hinayana, then you might be familiar with what's called the four right efforts. And the four right efforts are regarding dharmas. In particular, it's regarding wholesome dharmas, like good behavior, and unwholesome dharmas, bad behavior. And the idea is, is that we are working on increasing good dharmas. This is Hinayana, by the way, I want to remind you. In the Hinayana, we are working on increasing good dharmas, like loving compassion and kindness. And we are working on decreasing unwholesome dharmas, say like anger. And so the idea is, is that in Hinayana Buddhism, we're in this situation where some of the ideas and behaviors that we have are wholesome and some are unwholesome, and they're arising and they're ceasing, and they're getting more and they're getting less, meaning you're getting more angry or you're getting less and less angry until anger has actually ceased. So the language of increase or decrease has particular, it's particularly related to this idea of increasing or decreasing wholesome and unwholesome dharmas. But based on the Mahayana, based on what Manjushri or the sutra is teaching, or within the Mahayana, there is no increase or decrease of anything. But that's, again, because all of this is based upon this teaching of emptiness, where to not understand emptiness, that's the problem that then allows for the perceived increase of anger or what have you. So that's this kind of interesting idea. And, and this relates, by the way, I wanted to mention this in response to Maria's comment. So it's this idea of like working day and night, like working you know, vigorously day and night to get somewhere. And the point is, is that that is the problem. And it doesn't matter if you're trying to get enlightened and you're working day and night to get enlightened, that you're, it's the wrong approach in that sense. And so this idea that the Bodhisattva still works vigorously day and night in that way, but without any delusion about anything getting better or worse in that sense. So hope that kind of resonates and makes sense. Cool. Yeah, Maria, please. This seems like the um, related to or the same idea as um, there's no difference between the enlightened and the unenlightened person. It's the enlightened person that knows that. Excellent. That is, I, I use that one a lot and I, that is the idea. Okay, so one last thing to mention that, or one last thing that I would like to mention, it's also some like Vajra Sutra wisdom coming at you that I want to address. It's an idea that popped up here a lot. And in particular, you'll recall I'm on page 275. And at the bottom, the Buddha uses this analogy that if a great magician produces a magic crowd of a billion beings and then destroys them again, no harm or good is ever done to these magic creatures. And then that's followed up by all beings are illusory, like magic. No borders or limits can be found. 
no one or one who knows this absence of limits will never tire of living in the world. So I want to address this idea in case you're not super familiar with it. <clears throat> I want to address this idea of the illusory nature of sentient beings. And in particular, there was also a line, I won't try to, I won't spend too much time trying to find it, but it was also about ultimately about how life is illusory. So that's right up there with sentient beings are illusory, life, all of these things. So to appreciate this, I like to, yeah, we have a little bit of time. So to appreciate this idea, this Vajra wisdom idea, which is that in terms of emptiness, there's no self, no individuality, no sentience or life that all four of those are more lakshana. Those are more characteristics. Now, the idea here is, is what we wanna think about, and it's about this idea of being a living being. So, of course, the idea is, is that there's living being, and then, Look, this is a non-living being, the little, the bird, right? It hasn't moved for years. It's, it's not alive, right? So the idea here is, is that just like I was saying at the opening of tonight's class, the confusion is that characteristics are inherent in the thing. And that goes for the characteristic of being alive. Now, what I want you to, this is kind of a mental exercise to, to work through, but this is what I want our, us to appreciate. So in terms of characteristics, especially if you're familiar with my cups and the idea of big and little and knowing that big is relative to little, but little is relative to big, and therefore those are not inherent. You could do the same exact, like you could think the same exact way in terms of, you might think that I have the characteristic of being alive, because that has the characteristic of not being alive. But why, why do you think that has the characteristic of not being alive? Because compared to me that keeps moving around in that way, it's not alive. So those characteristics of living and not living are also dependently originated in that way. But just like all the characteristics we've been talking about, we can forget that. And we can assume that the thing has the characteristic or the quality of life in that way. But what I wanna get around to in terms of this kind of thought experiment, you could think about the idea of life. And what you could do is you could think, you know, this moving aroundness that I'm exhibiting, this talking that I'm exhibiting, this thinking that I'm exhibiting, there's a way in which a certain worldview, a kind of a scientific materialist worldview, could examine this and break it down to its molecular structure and then say, you know what? There is no such thing as life. It's just actually really, really complex bioelectrical chemical reactions. But bioelectrical chemical reactions are physical phenomena and therefore they are inert. They are not alive. So you could, in other words, reduce everything 
to not being alive by through scientific materialism. And what I'm getting at is, is that if you were to read this sutra and you didn't know your dharma, and you heard that there was no such thing as life, you could then presume, oh, because everything is, quote, dead, because everything is inanimate. But that's not what they're saying. But you could think that way. You could mistakenly think that way and reduce everything to not being alive. By the way, you could also do the opposite which is you could actually understand everything as being in a way aspects of consciousness and therefore everything is alive in that way. That actually the idea of inert and dead is actually just a concept of life, of, of the living being in that way. So, you could do it the opposite way where you just elevate everything to the level of a kind of animism or a kind of everything is alive. Nope, we're not doing that either. <laughs> it's a more subtle zone when the Buddha says that there is no life in that way. We want to avoid these, uh, these extremities in that sense of moving either all the way towards, oh, you mean everything's dead? Or, oh, you mean everything is alive with spirit or what have you? No, actually what we want to understand is that both of these, living, not living, are word concept ideas. And they only have meaning relative to each other in that sense. And so what I'm getting at is, is that there's a, a really it's a very fine line that one walks with this teaching of emptiness. And what it is, is, is that there's this kind of rash temptation that when you hear about emptiness, it's like, oh, well then, you know, let's get rid of all that then, because you're telling me it doesn't exist. And what we want to do is, is we want to be a little more gentle in that way. And so rather than projecting and superimposing these qualities onto things we don't want to do that because that's totally ignorant again we don't want to be super rash and just then throw the thing away say oh it doesn't exist anyways what we actually are going for is an understanding of why does this why does that appear to not be alive we want to understand why that appears to not be alive and I'm using my language fairly carefully, why it appears to not be alive. That, so again, it's kind of this delicate line to walk where we don't throw things away, but we don't cling to them as if they have those qualities or they are existent in that way. And in that kind of mindset of not abandoning, but not clinging, that's where the clarity comes in of truly being able to see things quote, as they are, a dangerous term, but I think you know what I mean, like, as they are appearing, and understand why they're appearing that way. <laughs> and oh, by the way, I did, I meant to bring up the idea of language, and that these words ideas that there's this word living, and this word dead, and those words have relationship to each other. I wanted to bring that up because of the very opening of the poem. All play words arise from the mind. So it's this recognition on the part of the Buddhists that all of these words are just that, are just words in that sense. But we mistake them for entities and realities in that way. So... All right, that's going to conclude uh, this Dharma Doors, unless there's any questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Okay, then that'll do it for me tonight. And next week, I'll be up in San Francisco on Sunday from 1 to 4.
So not our evening slot, but from one to four, and we'll be online and we'll be reading a sutra and we'll be going through it and we'll be doing some meditation and we'll be doing some, a whole bunch of stuff. It'll be, it's basically a super Dharma doors workshop. So. <laughs>